All right. Hey, folks. Uh, thanks for coming to another regular meetup of uh, NG Party Meetup Group. It's a 29th meetup. So thanks for coming. A uh, long time no see because COVID and stuff. But uh, we are back for this year. And hopefully, you'll be able to join us for uh, this new format. Uh, with that said, uh, let's start with the, with the meetup. So before we begin, uh, I would like to thank our main partner or supporter, which is LiveSport. It's an amazing company uh, that is based here in Prague. And they truly understand support of open source. And thanks to them, we can do things like this and also support various other communities and open source projects. But uh, no spoiler alerts. We will have some announcements after this meetup. So stay tuned. Thanks again, LiveSport. For those that are new to NG Party, uh, some uh, some quick recap about us. Uh, it's a local independent group for next generation JavaScript. Like the focus is mainly JavaScript, of course, but we are open to any new cool ideas. Also, people uh, get confused by that NG uh, abbreviation. It's not Angular. It's a next generation. Now you know. Uh, we <laughs> we we founded this uh, meetup in 2015, quite a long time ago. Maybe you remember those times when you could have a good beer in a pub. That's how we started in Prague Sugar Republic. And uh, there were three founding members, myself. My name is Martin Hochel, so hey, everyone. I'm Mario Weilbeck and William Elisher. Uh, currently, only I'm running uh, this meetup. But yeah, it's manageable. Now let's uh, go to or to have a couple of announcements. So first, uh, important announcement uh, regarding this year uh, or, the, or setup for our meetup for 2021. So as you notice, uh, COVID is unfortunately still here. So we're going to do only online meetups uh, that are going to take one hour. Uh, we know your time is precious, and we don't want to spend another extended uh, period behind uh, the screens. And we're going to have only one special guest uh, uh, for per every meetup. That means more focused and deeper technical talks to particular topics. And of course, we're going to have uh, Q and A's uh, during every meetup with our special guest. Last but not least, uh, as always, we're looking for speakers. Uh, so don't be shy. Uh, if you if you would like to have a talk at our meetup, uh, just submit our, our uh, form and we will get back to you. SAP. If you are interested uh, to learn more about Engine Party or just follow us uh, in general, uh, please reach us on various social media networks on Twitter, we are LinkedIn, Facebook, meetup.com platform, or you can join our Slack group uh, if you if you're interested into more like deep discussions. Unfortunately, Slack is quite private, so it's not very open sourcey thing, but uh, it is how it is for now. All right, so what's on today's schedule? Uh, we're going to have a very quick lightning talk called TLDR This uh, by NG Party team. And just a couple of news uh, that uh, happened in a uh, in web ecosystem. And then we're going to have our special guest, uh, Christian Botte, talking about satisfying your CSS in JS in just one kilobyte. And after that, uh, of course, there's going to be Q&A. So please uh, ask your questions in a YouTube stream, and we will pick various of your questions uh, so they can be answered as well. And that's it regarding announcements. Let's commit this and keep going. And with that, uh, I'm going to start the, the lightning talk called TLDR, which stands for Too Long Didn't Read by NG Party. So uh, there was a new release of TypeScript 3, uh, 4, 4.2. Excuse me. Uh, it's another awesome release by TypeScript team and community that uh, keeps improving with every every release. So check it out. Uh, there is a there are very thorough uh, announcements regarding this release. Also for folks that are using Babel, Babel re released uh, 7.13 version, which also supports TypeScript 4, 4.2, and adds uh, like tuples and records. Transpiler, transpilers, so you can you can try it out because that's not in any browser, but you can play with it, and many many other features. Uh, regarding like 
tools or bundlers in general or tooling for front end, there was a new release of WIT 2.0, which is a new tool developed by uh, even you, the author of Vue.js, which lever leverages under the hood uh, ES build, which is built in Go and it's extremely fast. So I don't know what they're using. Like uh, I've been using with, with my team's Webpack primarily, and that might get slow when your uh, application grows, like your code base. And this WIT 2.0 is like blazingly fast, so much, much faster than, than Webpack. So definitely check it out. Next interesting thing uh, on the Twitterverse or in general on GitHub, uh, there is uh, PR, which is an RFC for NPM CLI by, by Orta. He works at TypeScript team. And that RFC proposes uh, to unify the ecosystem so NPM CLI can uh, can work similarly like Yarn Run or NPX. So you are able to execute your uh, NPM binaries directly uh, with NPM as well. So that's quite exciting. Hopefully it will it will get merged. Another one is uh, by Sokra, the, the author of Epic. It's uh, kind of issue slash uh, PR, but uh, actually it's a PR, and he he he, he very thoroughly described uh, what's uh, what's the issue and did a lot of benchmarks regarding regarding TSC incremental builds being slow and how to improve them. So this is really a top notch PR slash issue, and I would really love to see uh, PR as an issue being done in this way. So like very nicely described uh, benchmark, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Again, you can learn a lot uh, from that PR, so check it out. Uh, regarding articles, uh, there is this uh, particular one from uh, Nolan Lawson. Uh, it's about just performance beyond bundle size. Uh, recently, bundle size is a very hot topic uh, to be discussed uh, in, in web development, and uh, Nolan points on various other aspects. So again, uh, I highly recommend this article. On, uh, you, can, you can learn a lot and also apply those learnings in your daily jobs. Regarding tools, there is this GitHub One S, uh, which is, which feels kind of like a magic. Basically, if you have uh, any GitHub repository open in the browser and you add uh, uh, that One S suffix, that particular repository will open in uh, online Visual Studio code. So you can browse through the repo and, and do all these familiar stuff uh, that you can use with VS Code on your machine. It, it's, it's pretty exciting. Check it out. Another thing uh, from the section today I learned, uh, there is a very nice video uh, that describes the difference between Git Merge and Git Rebase. So that uh, might be useful as well. And based on that, also uh, some, uh, some uh, dude pointed out uh, uh, to this, to this very nice uh, write-up regarding fix-up. I don't know if you, if you know about this, but you can use fix-up to add uh, some changes to already existing commit uh, in non-destructive way. So it's much uh, much better readable during pull requests for the reviewers. And there is a nice guide. It's actually in an Angular, Angular or GitHub repo, as far as I remember. So yeah, check it out as well. And that's it for my side. And now. I would like to introduce our special guest. Uh, hello, Christian. Oh, hello, Martin. How are How you? How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Doing good. yeah same here. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, everyone, please welcome Christian, and uh, the stage is yours. Oh, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for having me, Angie Party. Um, today um, I'm gonna be I'm gonna talk, talking about um, basically how I managed to create a, a really really small library for CSS in JS um, in just like one K, um, and you'll know why um, and in in a few. <laughs> minutes, uh, not minutes, more than a few minutes. Um, but if there's like one thing that I'm gonna be doing today um, is I'm definitely gonna satisfy <laughs> your CSS in JS 
curiosity for sure. Um, but first, um, I just like to uh, introduce myself. I think that's the nice thing to do, uh, just so we can get to know each other better. Um, so, as Martin said, my name is Christian, um, or uh, I, I'm from Romania, from Cluj Napoca. Um, I'm a member of the Preact core team. Um, for those of you who don't know what Preact is, is a 3K alternative to React with the same API, more or less. Um, I'm currently a JavaScript architect at Frontity. Um, check it out as well. It's a, it's a great project. Um, and also, I'm creator of Goober. <laughs> and you can find out more uh, at goober.rocks. Um, so as I said, I'm from, uh, from Cluj-Napoca. And I'm not sure if you know, but Cluj-Napoca is in Transylvania. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm not a vampire. But I do bite off. <laughs> the bytes from your source code. So there you go. Just beware. I'm gonna I'm gonna bite it off. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I presented myself like this a while ago, and I just uh, it just stuck with me. <laughs> so yeah, it it was a lame, a lame attempt to a to a to a joke. All right, moving on. Um, this is the quick review about what are we going to be talking today. Um. You know, when Martin reached out, um, I, I, I know, like, I, I mean, I know so much about Kuber, but um, the CSS in JS ecosystem just evolves <laughs> from, you know, um, day by day. That's just, is really, I, I don't, I don't want to say that it's really difficult to catch up, but it's difficult to stay on top of things. So, but if your guidance is, uh, you know, super, super straight and you're focused on one thing, uh, that thing should be like the web performance. And that's why I wanted to like take a quick, quick intro to web performance um, and what that means for, to me. Um, and then tie it up to the super short roundup of different ways of styling and obviously ending up on CSS in JS um, uh, ways of styling uh, on the web. Uh, and also, you know, um, explaining how this Goober achieves the promised CSS in JS in 1K, basically. Um, so, yeah, uh, first thing first, um, you know, what is web performance? Um, yeah, it's a, is it, is it like a silver bullet? Is it something that you just like uh, bring <laughs> and that's it? You, you get a, a performant web. Um, I don't know. Uh, for me, the experience on web was um, a real, really, um, you know, from native apps, uh, which were built for for uh, for web uh, to websites, um, static, dynamic, and so on, and all sorts of interactive application. Um, I started uh, with Flash uh, as a developer, so I moved to JavaScript uh, when Flash kind of like started fading out. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I was building games, so the performance was always there uh, in my mind. So that's why when I um, pivoted towards JavaScript and the web and so on, the performance kind of like stuck with me. So um, I would like to have like a, a really, really small checklist just to make sure that uh, what I'm doing is performing and so on. Um, just, you know, heads up. Uh, this is by no means a complete checklist. Um, the the actual the um, you know hands-on checklist for performance in in web um, is going to be really huge. So these are just my uh, my checklist. Uh, I would say for uh, what I consider to be a, 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 a you know a website or a performant website in today's ecosystem. All right. So first thing is little no JavaScript. I think that's a, that's a given, right? Um, static content as much as possible. Um, that doesn't say that. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, it's not necessary to have a static file on the disk. It can also be um, generated in memory and serve it statically without changing it. That that's uh, you know working great as well. Um, and then and the small amount of requests. Usually when you include render blocking requests in head if they're not asking. That means if you have uh, you know multiple requests, just think third party JavaScripts, that's gonna be blocking your rendering, which is not great. 
Uh, then moving on to the compression part, um, always compress your content, um, either the documents or the assets. And obviously you'll see the ends um, that's either like for uh, static resources or on the edge, uh, like cloth workers and so on. All right, but you know, really, what is a what is a top notch one hundred percent or one hundred points on Lighthouse um, really looks anyway? Um, I gotta hand it to you. Um, mostly, it's a it's I don't want to say it's a guessing game, but if you get it right, you get it right, and you know it. But recently, um, I've seen this experiment um, done by by Shane. Osborne, hopefully I didn't screw up your name, Shane. Um, mm. He's doing a, a really cool experiment called Next Node.js, uh, basically building with Next.js framework, but without outputting JavaScript or um, on-demand strategy, how he calls it. Um, and he recently tweeted out this, uh, and you can follow him on Twitter and also check out the project. Um, he recently tweeted this about um, using Formic, to render um, a form that works without JavaScript, and also added uh, a thousand DOM nodes from Markdown. Um, and I mean, we, we we can split hairs if this is a valid test or not. If Lighthouse is really the the true performance score that everyone needs to be look on the lookout and so on. But um, the thing is, what uh, really you know stuck with me um, was the the idea that we have the same implementation, right? We have the same amount of nodes, more or less, um, but using two different frameworks, right? On on the left side, we have Preact, which is just three key, three k, and then uh, we have React, which is you know more close to forty k uh, when you comp when you add up the React and React DOM, and you obviously have a hit of performance, and that performance comes for from the amount of JavaScript that you deliver to, to your end user. And again, a biased opinion, but you know, if there's like a takeaway that then you know I want to put it put it out there. Um, you know, in in my mind, lots of JavaScript uh, it's strictly equal to bad web performance. Um, so yeah, that's that's my take on web performance. Ship as less JavaScript as possible. And that's what we're going to be talking more and more about uh, in the coming minutes. All right, but um, we're here to, to talk about styling, um, you know, and you, you might be wondering what does the uh, performance uh, really has to do with styling anyway. And the, uh, you know, good news here, <laughs> I would say, is that it has a lot to do uh, the way that you're uh, defining your styles, the way that you're shipping your styles. Um, there's there's lots of information on this, so I, you know, there's one hour or thirty minutes, not enough to condense all of that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna focus mainly on my area, um, and that is the amount of JavaScript that you're shipping to your visitors. Um, all right, so to do that. Um, let's have a quick recap of different ways of styling on the web. Um, obviously, it's going to be like just three ways. I think um, it's kind of obvious. It's going to be the pure CSS, uh, the compiled CSS, and then it's going to be the dynamic CSS, which will lead to um, CSS in JS. So um, just you know, heads up, these are not pros and cons. <laughs> These are just bullets on the list. Um, I couldn't stamp any of them at pros and cons because this is a sub, it, it could be like a really, really subjective uh, opinion. So um, take it as you will. All right, speaking about plain CSS, um, you know, the good thing is that it's based on an industry standard uh, and you got lots of resources and gotchas and lesson learned. Um, and, you know, th that can be helpful. Uh, you don't need a build step. Maybe if if you just want to concatenate multiple styles into just one huge one, you need one. But yeah, that can be done through the uh, command lines as well. It's easy to get included. You don't need anything to process your CSS uh, if it's just plain CSS. Um, but you know, 
maintaining it uh, might be a job in itself, <laughs> meaning uh, it's going to add up hours of hours of making sure that you're structuring right, um, you know, constantly fighting the cascading um, and, you know, with different system, which is uh, um, an exercise in itself, trying to um, learn all the system that um, you need to um, style your content. And obviously, you, everything you have to do by hand, for example, the prefixing and so on. So I think um, that's how the uh, CSS at build time or the compile one um, came to be, right? Um, we need that dynamic thing in CSS or generative, I would say, um, output. So uh, yeah, you can generate uh, lots of structures with ease based on a DSL or um, you know just uh, the language of that uh, build time styling language. Uh, you can use language features that are not standard, but they do output standard CSS, kind of like poly polyfill, polyfill thing. Um, and also, you can do auto prefixing for you. So, you know, that, that can be great for productivity. But, you know, you do need a build step, which uh, you might not, um, you know, have it already, or, you know, uh, it, it could be expensive from a developer experience. And also the dynamic values based on app state uh, could be tricky. Yes, you can do CSS first, but if you think like highly dynamic um, interactive things that can adapt a lot of CSS bars, uh, and you know, you can you can crash your browser with that. So be careful. All right, and then the last thing uh, I want to talk to you about is the dynamic CSS, or you know, you may know it as uh, the CSS in JS. Um, the good thing, um, you don't have a build step. Um, you do have auto prefixing if you need it. Um, is a maintenance uh, due to the API. Um, this is a this is a great um, topic just because um, you know you'll um, uh, this term collocate your styles with your actual code that you're shipping uh, by collocating uh, it's mean that uh, means that your styles are tightly coupled to your code that gets shipped so if you change um, something in your component you're going to be have to changing the styles as well if that if those styles needs to be changed so you don't have to have a separate file where you keep your styles, so it's really, really easy to, um, you know, to just change them and so on. Um, and also, it can be highly dynamic um, based on app state because it's JavaScript. So if you have JavaScript and your state is based on JavaScript, obviously your CSS in JS can be outputted dynamically based on that app state. Um, but yeah, of course, this comes with. Uh, a few drawbacks. Um, you you know um, some solutions might require a build step um, to I don't know output to um, some stuff, uh, and also it's difficult to extract static files if the library it's not thought as a, a no build no runtime library uh, like uh, Linaria or Treat. Um, these are CSS and JS libraries that they do not leave at, uh, at runtime, but then we get into the compile time uh, styles as well. So that dynamic um, gets lost again. And the added JavaScript runtime, and this is the one <laughs> topic that I'm going to be uh, sharing with you and discussing and dissecting more and more. Because, um, you know, this is what Goober is all. Um, all about. Um, but first, um, Andre Pfeiffer did this really thorough CSS and JS analysis. Um, he went through, at that time, <laughs> all the CSS in JS. I do believe that uh, the libraries in CSS and JS uh, ecosystem, they evolve each day. So uh, if you find something that's not in this repo, I think Andre is more than happy to help out and, um, you know, just update the benchmarks and analysis and so on. So yeah, do check it out. Uh, I highly encourage you to. 
All right. Um, so let's talk about Google. Because uh, we talk about CSS, we talked about the added JavaScript runtime for the CSS in JS. Um, and one thing that um, you know, I've I've always um, been um, uh, like my mind always defaults to that uh, is whenever I see uh, something, you know, a, a huge JavaScript file, I always try to say, okay, we we need to shrink that, we need to shave some more bytes and so on. Um, and that was th that's how Goober was born. I I was doing a side project website um, building with style components, um, and I was close to delivering it. And when I realized the, the JavaScript bundles, um, and ooh, the, those were huge. And I, I, I at that point I was like, no, I, I cannot afford that. I just don't want to ship that much JavaScript. Um, and that led me to uh, set up some requirements uh, and just started to uh, basically just write code. At that point, the only thing that I did it was the styled API, uh, which creates a style components, uh, the CSS, which creates or returns a class name that already has the styling uh, being appended. I needed a way to extract the CSS uh, at, the, at on on the server or at build time, just so I can place it um, inside the uh, style tag, and then also I needed a, a global way of defining the styles, um, and uh, that function <laughs> I've called it globe um, from global, but I couldn't afford the letter the the character A and L <laughs> because of the size. So that got shrinked down to just globe. So and there was um, a small anecdote there. Yeah, and with this in mind, I just basically laid out a, a plan on how to how to do it, um, and I just started coding. Um, obviously, Goober is at version two point zero point thirty three, I think. Um, it it evolved. It's not the same. Um, it's not the same um, set set of features. Um, it went through some, um, you know, a few iterations. Um, it, the feature set grew. Um, it evolved in terms of speed. Um, but one thing that uh, was mostly constant uh, is the size. Um, I think I've. I was really, really, really vocal about it. And I was always trying to keep the size uh, in mind whenever I, I wanted to develop something or start working on something or if that feature wanted to get in or not. Um, the main deciding factor uh, was always the, the size added um, to the code base or to the output. Yeah, so... Um, with that in mind, um, let's just um, see how the you know most of the CSS in JS solutions work, and I'm gonna be uh, doing that. Uh, let me maximize. All right, with Excalibur. <laughs> um, yeah, this is something that um, I've recently picked up on. Uh, thanks to thanks to Luis. So shout out to Luis for uh, showing me the way <laughs> to having a, an online whiteboard, basically. So yeah, that's uh, that's great. Okay, let's start. Um, all right. So most of the CSS and JS uh, libraries they do help. They do offer a styled um, API meaning you have a function that returns uh, a React component. And that React component is already has already defined a class name. And that class name already is attributed to the input that you already passed to the styled API. So we're going to be starting to the styled, uh, to the call to the API, right? With the, with the tag name div. So this is going to be a div, which would have the font size of one rams. And when hovering, it's going to be having the color red. 
I think this is pretty much self-explanatory, but you know, just keep this in mind. Um, and let's move along. So the next step after calling the styled API internally, most of them, they do call the CSS. Um, the CSS API, um, if you give it an input, which is the same input from styled, it's going to return um, a class name. Um, that class name has already been, um, you know, uh, generated, attributed to, to a style in the style tag and so on. So depending on the, um, on the library, this could either be an atomic or that means multiple class names, um, one class name per, per property, per CSS property. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty much that, that, that's what's, that's what's happening in, internally. Uh, the thing is the tag template or the strings are not pure, uh, CSS. So most of them are doing a transform of the input into an, um, uh, abstract syntax tree um, or just a print object uh, of course it depends on the library um, but you know this is like an abstract um, uh, how how most of them are working uh, all right so this is an object with the input of the CSS this input gets generated into a hash that hash uh, is based on the contents of the input uh, again, if it's an atomic uh, library, meaning um, each property with their own class name, you're going to have multiple class names here or multiple hashes. If not, you're just going to have one which uh, represents that style. Um, in case of the Goober, because we're going to be talking about Goober, um, this is how the hash is formed. Um, it just starts with uh, G and O and then uh, a few numbers depending on the length of the string. Um, and then since we have the uh, ESD or the object and we have the hash, now we can generate the real CSS. So next step is uh, transform that object, that input into real CSS. So that means generating um, a, a string that uses the hash as a class name from here um, with the properties. So you see already this is real CSS and can be up appended to the style tag. Um, and that's what's going to be happening next. Next, um, In the case of updating the style tag, there are a few different approaches. I mean, mostly different. Um, there is an interesting API that I think install components were the first one um, who popularized it. Uh, that means the insert rule API on a style sheet instance. Uh, the thing is um, that rule inserts the styles in the CSS uh, object model. So you won't see those styles in the style tag in the DOM. Um, Goober's approach um was instead of having this insert rule api and so on try to have an empty text node inside the style tag and modify the text node uh the data property on that text node because that's the fastest way to to update a text node um, in the dom elements and this was really popularized and um made viral by jason miller um, so yeah, that's what we did. I mean, at some point, um, in Goober, we wanted to switch out to the insert rule, but, uh, performance gains just weren't there. Um, and we would lose on the ability to modify and inspect your styles. I mean, of course, Chrome, um, afterwards came out with, uh, with the dev tools that let you inspect the, um, the insert rule based styles, but that's another story. Um, all right, so depending on the mode, if if we need to append it or not, uh, we update the, the style tag. And that's pretty much it. At this point, with the box, with the above box, um, which is here, if you render it, you're going to get, uh, you know, just a regular uh, virtual node or fiber node with its property. Um, and the class name already defined and attached. 
And of course, most of the style components um, or the styled library uh, will take care of the class name, uh, appending it, um, and so on and so on. This is great. Um, you know, when you, when you take like a high level overview of how this is working, but I wanna I wanna do to you one better. So we've been talking about styled um, and styled API and so on and so on, but I like to tie together each step with uh, how Goober handles it, because uh, most of the times um, Goober either skips or uh, concatenates more more of this logic into just one step. And I think that's how I uh, mostly saved on the size. Uh, and you'll see, depending on the implementation, that um, you know this is this ended up to be really, really rewarding. All right, so let's rewind to the beginning. Uh, we start with a styled called um, in Goober we cannot afford the styled dot API because that would mean to have all the DOM elements um, be there available statically on the styled function and it's just not worth it, right? Um, so I think Emotion does as well, um, but they do already, uh, they, they do provide the dot uh, um, um, properties on the styled as well. But Goober, that's one way we shave some some bytes um, or bite off the bytes um, just by not having that there. And that was pretty much liberating when it came to um, extending previously style components um, and uh, or using uh, custom elements. You'll um, yeah, I'll talk about that later. Anyway. All right, so moving on, the first call is the style with the tag. Uh, you can also do the, um, um, yeah, hopefully it's visible enough. Um, I think I can do one more step, yeah. Yeah, it's all, all good, right, sorry. awesome. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is the style function uh, from Goober. Uh, again, receives the tag, but also the forward ref, if you want to forward, uh, if, you want to, if you want to get a ref of that element but this is not the topic for discussion. Um, then the styled function uh, with the tag name returns a, a wrapper function. This wrapper is here just so we can capture the arguments. And in this case, it's the input. So whatever you're sending a tag template, an array, a function, or an object, um, it's here in the underscore args um, a variable. And then at the at the bottom, if you want to forward ref, uh, if you want to wrap it in forward ref, uh, we just use that forward ref reference that you're passing it and wrap it with styled. Uh, and then we just return the main styled functional component, which will receive the props. And in the case of a ref, we'll receive the ref as well. But uh, moving to step two, which means calling CSS internally, that's exactly what Goober does as well. Initially, it was the, the other way around, which is a bit odd. <laughs> and the CSS was calling the styled uh, component, but that got changed, uh, um, I think, in version two of Goober. Uh, no, version one, sorry. Yeah, anyway, moving on. Um, here, we call the CSS API um, with the args, meaning the input. In this case, it's a tag template. And also we call it with a with the context. On this context um, is actually the styled function context. You'll see in a moment why. And then in that context, we uh, keep a reference to the props. And also, if there's if there was a previous class name, uh, which dictates the append or prepend um, extending um, ex extending API. All right. Next step is transform the string into an object. So if you go into the CSS uh, function uh, in Goober, uh, you see a couple of things happening here, uh, which, how I said uh, previously, uh, Goober either steps over it or um, does a composing of multiple things into one. Um, so at this step, uh, Goober, um, if the value, which is the, which is the input in this case, um, 
is going to be a tag template because we're still here in this step. Um, it needs to be transformed into an object. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> All right. Um, but the but Goober also accepts uh, a function. So if that's a function, and that's how we check for a function, we just call it with the properties. Just remember on the context, uh, we keep them a reference on the dot p, uh, and that return value um, depending on the type that you're sending. So if this is a, if this is an array, um, because the tag templates initially are arrays as well. Um, and raw is a property on the uh, tag template instance. So if there's a tag template, that means we need to compile it into a string. Otherwise, um, if it's a regular array thing, um, we just have to assign it and concatenate it into an object. If there's, you know, if, if this is either a string or a, or a, um, or an object, we just pass it on to the hash function. The hash function um, takes care of generating the hash and also transforming the input into an object. And that's what I uh, meant when I was saying that Goober either steps over or uh, merges more steps into one. And moving on to the hash function, um, the first argument is the compiled, which means it's either an object or a string. And based on that uh, compilation, uh, we uh, generate a class name based on the input. And that class name uh, is done by the uh, to hash function, which is just a hashing function. Um, but that, that's not the important bit. The important bit that does the transformation from string uh, uh, to, to objects uh, is this ast ish function. I call it ish just because um, it's not a real EST. Uh, you know, it's just I want to have it there um, and act like an EST. Uh, hopefully, this is pretty, pretty uh, clear what it does, but I'm not sure if it is. Um, so the new rule is, is basically just a regex rule. That makes sure um, to captures to capture groups um, of selectors, properties, values, and then end of a um, of a um, curly brace. And based on those blocks, uh, as you can see here, which is uh, which is the result of the uh, regex execution, um, I use the blocks uh, existence as a flag. If, uh, and I'm building this tree, which I'm um, basically depending on the block existence. Uh, block tree, I think, is just a I think it's just a class name or the selector. And I build this tree of lists of uh, properties and values and so on and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, uh, do check it out. And at the end, I'm just returning the. Um, the root or the root node of the tree. Uh, I think this is the proudest function that I've ever built. And then uh, it, it took me a really, really long time to <laughs> to come up with it. But anyway, let's let's back let's get back to the execution process. So right now we have the ESD, um, which is an object. Uh, we have the class name, which is the hash of the contents. Um, the only thing that uh, remains is um, parse the ESD with the hash and generate the real CSS. Um, and that's what um, parse function does. Uh, this one is a bit long, um, so I'll, I'll have to zoom out in order to see it better. But basically, it's just a, a lengthy execution uh, rules with all these ifs, else, and so on. Uh, which uh, I don't think I have the time to, to get into. But uh, this is the important bit, the parse, depending on uh, on the flags. And the class name generates the, the real CSS. 
and keeps it uh, in a cache, obviously, just so we don't regenerate the same thing over and over again. And at the end, we just do the update uh, with a um, CSS that's being generated in here, uh, with a reference to the sheet, and also with a append flag, if that's needed or not. So if you go into the uh, update function, it's literally uh, the pseudocode that I've written in this uh, rectangle here in, in, in Excalibur. Um, you know, if this is if this exists, um, yeah, I'm just gonna. I'm just going to append in. Otherwise, um, you know, just going to prepend to the end of the data property. And the hash function at the end just returns the class name. And if you go here, um, that's what we are ending up with in, um, in the style function, moving back. So we have the underscore props with the class name, which is returned from CSS, because the CSS function returns the output from the hash, and the hash returns the, up, the output of the class name. So in the end, the h function um, just renders the v node with the props already predefined with the class name, which has the output from CSS. And at this point, the styles are already being appended um, to to the uh, to the style tag, and we can make use of it. Um, yeah, that was pretty much uh, it. I think I don't have anything else. <laughs> so, Martin, back to you in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Yeah, man, that was that was quite cool. I I really enjoyed the Excalibur uh, representations and how you. Yeah, uh, showcase this, showcase those uh, in uh, in the code base. That was that was really awesome. We have uh, yeah. a couple of questions, so uh, awesome. Let's start uh, with this one. Uh, Florian was asking mm -hmm. uh, if basically if Guber would work uh, out of the box with Angular. Yeah, so that that's a good question, uh, Florian. Thank you for thank you for asking. Um, so uh, one thing that um, I didn't set, but um, uh, it's um, you know it's been like the motto or the um, reason for Google existence is that it's not it's not based of a flavor of a library. So you're gonna have to call uh, if you want to use it into a virtual DOM environment with a styled API. You're gonna have to set up Goober, uh with a pragma function. Which in React world, that's create element in Preact is the hard H function. But if we're speaking strictly about Angular or Vue or any other or Svelte, uh, there are folks who use uh, Google with Svelte as well. Uh, you can just use the CSS function instead and create your own style if you if you really need it. Um, the nicest thing about CSS is really versatile. So um, I think the first uh, major contributor to Goober, I, I think Michael. Uh, hopefully, I'm not <laughs> mistaken. Um, he needed Goober to work with with custom elements and web components, and that's one of the things why we have the whole context passing on to the CSS function as well, because you can um, basically the target, which is the sheet in the uh, um, in the browser context. That sheet can be also defined inside a custom element, you know, because you have the shadow root and then you have the style node in there as well. So you can bind it to the CSS and use that to declare, uh, you know, as a CSS in JS thing, but using web components. So I don't see why you wouldn't be able to use with Angular. I haven't been using it. I don't see. It. I didn't see it in the wild yet, but yeah. Cool, if you do, yeah. let me know. <laughs> Good question, Florian. Thanks, and great answer. Another question, uh, again, from Florian. He's uh, very active. What's the process when coming with such complicated regular expressions? <laughs> oh, man, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Florian. Um, <laughs> so my, my, my go-to um, tool is regexer. Um, this is a is a nice nice tool. I mean, there are lots of them out there. So you know, uh, anyway. But Grant Skinner, the author of uh, Regexer, um, he's been um, <laughs> in the Flash world as well, 
really popular. I don't know why, but I think I've used regex from that time when we was written in Flash, and just um, I stuck with it. The thing is, it you have this nice, nice on the left side cheat sheet uh, when you can like you know just use it to uh, make sure that you do uh, what you do uh, or you achieve what you want to do. So yeah, that's uh, that's my recommendation. Use regexer and I don't know. <laughs> just just, just curious, just curious. Do you have uh, like some suite of uh, unit tests to cover that they work? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, and that's like ooh, a really, really. Uh, oops. Um, I think without them, I, I'm not sure if I can do anything else. Um, yeah. So if, you know, in 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 core, uh, you have test, and then you have the ESD ish. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think this uh, this one is a bit long, but it covers uh, most of it. Um, you know, a lot lots of lots of stuff like comments being stripped out, um, nesting uh, with media. Um, you know, uh, the old operators and so on, different types of input. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I don't know, the the keyframes as well. Oh yeah, this is an this was a. <laughs> This was an important one. It took me a while to get it right. But yeah, uh, I mean, without tests, I don't know if Goober could have, uh, you know, just progress day, day to day. So yeah. yeah. Sounds, sounds good. It's uh, it's also very good for uh, potential contributors that uh, yes. they, ca they can be welcome. sure they don't, yeah, they don't, don't break anything. Yes. All right. Yes, uh, exactly. Next question is from Andre. Uh, the styled API is only available for React, right? I mean, it's available for um, every framework that uses the pragma method to render out uh, things. Um, if um, if there's a framework that uses uh, a pragma function but does not output JSX um, or just it just needs a function that receives props. And respects obviously the uh, class name and so on. That you, I mean, just the class name, <laughs> naming. Otherwise, uh, it's pretty uh, transparent for Goober. It just grabs the props and passes it on to the pragma function that you set up Goober with. I mean, again, people use it with Svelte and Vue, um, but I didn't see the style API used with with uh, Svelte, neither with Vue. So. Yeah, that's a good question. I think more into the they're more used into the uh, React ecosystem. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, makes makes sense. So speaking of which, uh, uh, React ecosystem uh, does Goober work in React Native? Uh, no. <laughs> Short answer, no. But it does work when so in my previous job. I think my main uh, focus was uh, we had a native app written in React Native, and we wanted to render the same app, um, you know, with the same code base, with the same styling definitions, and so on. Because you know, React Native has uh, a particular set of defining your styles. But we wanted for web. Obviously, there's React Native web, but um, checking out it, check it out on Bundle Phobia and. Um, your, I don't know, it's just like, it was like... It's not, it's not the brightest uh, bundle size, let's say. <laughs> exactly, you know, and just to have your native app rendered on React Native, uh, oh, sorry, on web, it was a bit too much. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just uh, get get down to it and build our own with Preact, Next, and Goober, obviously. So we, in Goober, we mimic the same style sheet API, and we, yeah, we, we managed to render our, um, I mean, I think the whole app was under 73K. Uh, I think it was close to 50Ks. So, mm -hmm. you know, we just, you know, we, by just not using an off the shelf solution uh, and just, you know, get to creating ourselves. Um, yeah, we, we shaved a lot. Um, there's also one, um, one project that I've <laughs> recently, um, Worked on called Preact Phobia. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Oh, interesting. Hopefully yeah, hopefully I'm not gonna get in trouble or anything. So 
Um, let me zoom in. Um, so uh, I can remember the name, uh, but Jason uh, told us at some point. Anyway, um, so basically, if you want to know how many copies of Preact can fit into a package, <laughs> you can you can use <laughs> React for BI to do it. So obviously, the first candidate, the React DOM. <laughs> So at this point, um, one copy of React DOM um, equals 10 copies of Preact. <laughs> but you know, this doesn't include the React uh, main library. So if you if you want to check the React, that's pretty much one to one, right? So yeah, that was uh, this this was a nice visualization of the ecosystem and so on. So um, yeah, I highly encourage you know everyone who uh, wants to check out on their JavaScript um, and the library they use, uh, you know, just go here and uh, yeah, <laughs> and check it out. Nice, nice. Well, yeah. we'll definitely definitely share this uh, with uh, with our community. Thank there you. is uh, there is another question again from again from Andre. Have you thought of removing tag template support? to strip off even more bytes? Um, so at some point, I was really, really um, inclined of uh, doing it, or at least uh, advise, advise people of not using tag templates for defining their styles. But um, at the end of the day, that tag template doesn't take that much that, that much space, right? Um, mm. Um, because if you if you look at the outputted CSS uh, outputted JavaScript that contains the CSS as well in there, it's gonna be filled with um uh, with new line characters, tab characters, and so on, which do compress uh, well enough. So at the end of the day, it is worth to use tag templates. So I didn't see a need to remove it just to shave some more bytes. Uh, shaving more bytes uh, is gonna be coming, um, I think, in the future when I'm going to be dropping even more stuff or using um, um, a, a new syntax uh, from JavaScript. Because, for, for example, uh, there was a pull request at some point, but that was um, downgrading the performance, and we had to um, not accepting it. So we could, use, we could shave, I think, around 100 bytes by using the spread operator instead of object.assign and so on and so on. Yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And speaking of tools <laughs> of checking compressions, oh, sorry. Um, there's the uh, GZ thermal. <laughs> um, hopefully, it's not gonna. Um, let's see. Yeah, no. Well, let me just get the uh, a link. So. It's gctermal.now.sh, uh, and you just passed in an URL, <laughs> and wow. you're gonna get a visualization of the gzip compression algorithm. <laughs> so if it's green, it's gonna get compressed well. Uh, if it's red, obviously it's not getting compressed well. So yeah, that's how I choose my variable names. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. If it's something with uh, blue, I'm going to reuse it. If not, yeah. Cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. Sure. So we don't have any more questions. Uh, I have two questions. We are almost out of time. So let's, uh, let's make this quick. First one All is right. uh, how is the, the auto prefixing handled? It's uh, in a compile time via some Babel transformer, or it's uh, uh, it comes with the runtime? It comes with the runtime in a separate package. Um, it's called uh, auto prefixer. Uh, where is it here? So it comes by default with Goober, but you have to manually uh, opt in into it. So you just import it with Goober slash prefixer and use the prefix function uh, and just pass it to the setup function. And you're gonna have it's the smallest. Um, uh, too bad that bundle phobia doesn't see the nested packages, but. Um, I think it's somewhere around 600 bytes. Wow. Yeah. Nice. And you can get the auto prefixer working. Yeah, it's really nice. Awesome. Sounds great. Cool. And yep. uh, the last question, uh, 
I saw some uh, JS doc comments in, in, the, in the source code. So I'm just curious, uh, are you using TypeScript and are there typings for Goober available? There are typings available, <laughs> but I'm not using TypeScript for a uh, for large chunk of, um, <laughs> I mean, Let's just uh, be, get clean with it. I wasn't um, that fun, that big fan of TypeScript, but I'm coming to embrace it. <laughs> so mo maybe the next Google iteration is going to be rewritten in TypeScript. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm still debating it. But we do we do have types. Yeah. So that, that's I think that's been like an entirely um, uh, built by the uh, community. So yeah. Nice. Thanks to the community. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Open source is important. Thanks for contributing, folks. Actually, there is one last question uh, from the audience. Uh, Jakub uh, is asking, uh, yeah, you can ask, of course, uh, if you would consider <laughs> using Wasm to do all the processing rather than squeezing bytes from unified JS. <laughs> Ooh, honestly, that's way over my head. Um... <laughs> I'm not sure if that's going to be, I mean, obviously it's going to be worth it in terms of performance and so on. But um, one thing that maybe it's worth mentioning, a lot a lot of third-party libraries. So for example, um, React Hot Toast or React Colorful. Um, I mean, just recently they switched to something else. But yeah, anyway, they're using Goober as part of their bundle. So. That's the I think that's the nice thing about um, having a CSS in JS in just around 1K because that can be part of your uh, you know distributed library or code base, and regardless of your added size, uh, it's going to end up really really small because you know if you're not going to include Goober, you're going to have to include something else which is larger in size, and you end up with lots lots of JavaScript, and that's not really appealing. Mm -hmm. So using Wasm might be, um, not by me, honestly. <laughs> if the community wants to do it and they're open to it, um, I'm definitely interested. But yeah, I don't see it like really, really happening. But yeah, it, it's a cool concept though. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess we are out of time. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. So thanks. <laughs> No worries, no worries, that's fine. Thanks again for coming. Thanks to the audience. Hopefully you, you found this yeah. useful. Uh, keep following us on various social media networks. We're going to announce another meetups with another special guests. This was uh, Christian Bote talking about <laughs> Uber. So Thanks a lot, Christian. Yeah, uh, thank you for having Stay safe. Me. Yeah, you always. And see you All next right. time. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Keep up. Bye-bye.